Brad uncovered the carpet and indeed found the escape tunnel. At that moment, D.B. Cooper grabbed a shovel and swung it at him. Brad caught the shovel and landed several punches on D.B. Cooper to prevent their escape plan from being exposed. He grabbed a water bottle and smashed it against Brad, knocking him unconscious. During the scuffle, D.B. Cooper's abdomen was cut by glass. He endured the pain and removed the glass. Looking at the unconscious Brad, Cooper decided to tie him up and throw him into the hole. D.B. Cooper cleaned up the break room and left. He found the other members and informed them of the situation. Originally, the plan was to escape in three days, but now they had to do it earlier. If the prison guards discovered Brad's disappearance, they would lock down the entire prison until he was found. Michael had John contact the airplane for pickup, arranged for Benjamin to get bleach from the kitchen, and took charge of obtaining the keys. The others figured out ways to remove their body odors to evade detection by police dogs. They planned to escape from Michael's room at 7 p.m. that evening. Sucre reminded Michael that Lincoln was still in solitary confinement. Under 24-hour surveillance, if they couldn't rescue him, the plan would proceed as scheduled. They couldn't let everyone be punished because of one person. Michael reluctantly nodded in agreement. The prison guards began discussing Brad, noting that he had never been late or absent since his first day of work. Hearing this, the escape team became even more anxious. Despite feeling guilty about the young informant, Michael informed Brad about tonight's escape operation. Michael took the opportunity to find Sarah while pretending to exchange medication and told her about the escape plan. She was surprised and questioned why he was telling her all this. Michael replied that only she could save the escape team and advised her not to lock her door after work. Apparently, the infirmary was their escape route. Sarah felt manipulated by Michael from the beginning. Michael admitted he did use her initially, but later developed genuine feelings for her. Michael couldn't expect forgiveness from Sarah because everything had been too cruel for her. He now only wanted to rescue his innocent brother. Sarah left without answering, slamming the door behind her. Michael prayed in his heart that Sarah would help him this time. The warden called Michael into his office to express gratitude for the Taj Mahal model he had completed. He said he owed Michael a favor and asked him to speak up if he needed anything. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Michael requested to see Lincoln. He informed his brother about tonight's escape plan. However, Lincoln was in solitary confinement, chained and unable to escape. Lincoln urged Michael to leave him behind. Otherwise, none of them would get away. Michael was deeply saddened because if he couldn't save his brother, his meticulously planned escape would lose its meaning. John secretly grabbed a handful of dried feces when the prison guards weren't paying attention and hid it in his pocket. Back in his cell, he scattered the feces onto his bed sheets. Teabag also collected foul beans and crushed them before smearing them on his bed. Benjamin concealed the bleach in his clothes and distributed it to the other members outside the kitchen. They needed to bleach their prison uniforms before the free time began, as they would pass through the psychiatric hospital section where the uniforms were white. Just as Sucre was bleaching his clothes, a prison guard suddenly approached. Sucre quickly sat on the toilet, pretending nothing was amiss. The warden prepared to have the Taj Mahal model moved but it collapsed just as they lifted it. They immediately called for Michael to fix it. Watching Michael being taken away, everyone felt anxious. All of this was within Michael's expectation. Michael intentionally removed the support frame of the model, causing it to collapse because he wanted to see the warden one last time. Michael took out a small knife and coerced him to move Lincoln to the infirmary, ensuring that Lincoln would stay there all night. Then he tied up the warden, hit him in the closet, and knocked him unconscious. He picked up the telephone receiver and placed it on the table. As he left, he told the secretary at the door that the warden was in a phone conference and didn't want to be disturbed. The secretary glanced at the phone and confirmed that it was on a busy line, since Michael often visited the warden's office. She had no suspicion. The action is about to start, and everyone is very nervous. Each person imagined the situation after they escaped, and the process seemed very long, with only five minutes left until the escape. Everyone anxiously waited. Sucre sat on the bed trembling nervously, while Michael rubbed his hands anxiously. Teabag also prepared himself, and at that moment, he glanced at John, from John's eyes. He seemed to perceive a hint of hostility because they had a previous conflict. Formerly, one of Benjamin's subordinates made a boxing gesture towards Benjamin. He planned to kill Benjamin during free time because of an argument with Benjamin when he was stealing bleach in the kitchen. When he was free, Benjamin hid in Michael's room when he saw his former subordinates bringing someone. They came to Michael's room but couldn't find Benjamin, so they reluctantly left. Fortunately, Benjamin had hidden in the escape tunnel. Narrowly escaping danger, Sucre pulled down the curtain, and one by one, 
They crawled into the hole behind the sink. After entering the pipeline, they heard deafening screams. At this time, Brad regained consciousness and used the corners of the walls to tear the tape. With his loud cry for help, two prison guards outside faintly heard his voice, and they hurriedly returned to the break room. In a critical moment, Teabag arrived and covered Brad's mouth. Michael took off Brad's uniform and put it on himself. They quickly reached the location beneath the exercise yard. They had to pass through the most dangerous area and then enter the psychiatric ward. Three watchtowers kept an eye on this distance. After everyone changed into bleached prisoner uniforms, Michael went alone to the alarm system. He took out the powder and blew it towards the button, causing a row of fingerprints to appear on it. Arranging the numbers in combination, Michael successfully triggered the alarm. Startled by the alarm, everyone was terrified, but Michael promptly explained that he triggered it, because only this way could the prisoners in the psychiatric ward be released. Once safety was ensured through inspection, the guards ordered the prisoners to return to their cells, and the team blended in with them. One of the guards recognized John and secretly informed Michael, dealing with the guard. They entered the sewer and arrived at the infirmary. Lincoln was being watched by a guard in the infirmary. However, as the guard turned his head, the escape team had already reached him. He had no choice but to obediently unlock Lincoln's handcuffs and promise not to call the alarm. Teabag still punched him down. Lincoln tries to pull Michael up, but there's always a little distance between them. They arrived at the entrance of the infirmary, and at this point, Michael could only pray that Sarah hadn't locked the door. The door opened, they successfully entered the infirmary. At this point, they only needed to remove the window and the security mesh. Then they could climb over the wall along the cable. Michael opened the fire hydrant and took out the fire hose, tying one end to the security mesh and the other end to the elevator's handrail. He would use the power of the elevator to pull down the security mesh. They covered the ground with sponge pads to prevent the windows from falling and causing a loud noise. At a critical moment, the elevator door wouldn't close. Michael tried again but to no avail. They didn't have much time left. Then, a hip-hop guy stepped forward. He entered the elevator and kept his hand on the elevator button, forcing the door to close. As the elevator descended, the fire hose gradually tightened, and the security bars were pulled open. When everyone took off their prison uniforms and prepared to climb out, an unexpected visitor arrived. It was Charles. He held a walkie-talkie and threatened them. He said he would call the police if they didn't let him escape with them. Helpless. Michael reluctantly agreed to take him along. Lincoln went first, laying a sheet on the iron mesh and then instructing the others to act quickly. John suggested lining up an alphabetical order by name so that he could be the first to leave. The others didn't dare to object because they still relied on John's plane to escape. The bolt securing the cable had already started to loosen. Suddenly, the injured D.B. Cooper fell to the ground and couldn't get up. He knew he couldn't escape and told Michael where he had the money. Twin K Town in Utah. That money wasn't just one million dollars. It was a whopping five million. Cooper hoped that Michael would give half of the money to his daughter, and the rest they could divide among themselves. Michael promised to fulfill D.B. Cooper's final wish. Teabag, who was nearby, overheard this and started to get restless. The warden's secretary seemed to notice something strange. She opened the door and found that the warden was missing, so she immediately called the guards. They discovered the warden locked in a closet after dialing his phone. The warden immediately ordered the alarm to be sounded, and the guards with police dogs searched for the escapees. At this point, only Michael and Sucre's cousin remained. Besides D.B. Cooper, Sucre's cousin urged Michael to go first. Hearing the alarm, Lincoln became extremely anxious, but luckily the searchlights didn't spot him. Just as Michael was about to reach the end, Sucre's cousin also climbed onto the cable. Due to the excess weight, the cable was pulled down, and Michael was left hanging in midair. Lincoln tries to pull Michael up, but there's always a little distance between them. At that moment, the guards spotted Sucre's cousin and pinned him to the ground at gunpoint. Lincoln took the opportunity to rescue Michael. Under interrogation by the guards, Sucre's cousin revealed the list of escapees. When the warden arrived at the infirmary, D.B. Cooper had already passed away. The prisoners learned about their fellow inmates' successful escape and celebrated wildly. The warden knew that if he couldn't catch them, it would be a disgrace to his career. By now, 15 minutes had passed since the prisoners escaped from the prison. The warden assembled all the guards and started the pursuit, authorizing the use of lethal force if necessary. Brad was rescued and asked his men to bring him a hunting rifle. He wanted to regain his dignity. The escape team didn't go far. They hid in the nearby bushes. No one could imagine that they were still close to the prison. Their scent had been eliminated, making them undetectable even by police dogs. However, 
Charles hadn't eliminated his own scent, so he would undoubtedly be a burden to everyone. Therefore, Lincoln and John staged a good act. They successfully ditched Charles. But the atmosphere inside the car remained tense. Teabag noticed John sitting behind him. Originally, John wanted to use the gun hidden under the seat to kill him. Teabag was prepared and handcuffed himself to Michael. John had to stop because he still relied on Michael to reveal the witness's testimony. They were five kilometers away from the airport and could successfully leave the United States as long as they boarded the plane. What they didn't know was that John's plane could only accommodate three people. Other than Michael and Lincoln, John had no intention of taking anyone else with him. Investigators found no signs of forced entry into the infirmary door. It was evident that someone deliberately left the door open for the prisoners. The warden threatened the doctor, stating that if she didn't report any information, she would not only lose her job but also be thrown into prison, helplessly. The doctor confessed and said that Sarah liked Michael. Finally, the warden understood that it must have been Sarah who intentionally forgot to lock the door. The police arrived at Sarah's house and found that she had injected a large amount of morphine and was in a severe coma. Veronica discovered through investigation that the vice president had bought a villa by a remote lake. She found the villa and sneaked inside quietly. She saw a disheveled old man sleeping in a chair and was certain that he was the vice president's brother. Just as Lincoln said, he didn't commit murder, he was framed by someone else. The vice president's brother was the CEO of a conglomerate. She created the fake death case for her brother to obtain his wealth. Lincoln was just a sacrificial pawn in this political struggle. The escape team encountered checkpoints along the way and chose to take a detour, but their car got stuck in the mud. With only three kilometers left to the airport, they decided to run there. Michael stopped the hip-hop guy because they had an agreement earlier that they owed each other nothing after leaving the prison. The guy left them and ran for his life alone. The search helicopter had arrived, but they were not detected. They found a car and Sucre quickly tried to start it. John opened the hood and discovered that the car didn't even have an engine. They continued running and found a warehouse along the way. Since Michael and Teabag were handcuffed together, their movements were slow, and they would eventually burden everyone. They wanted to forcefully break the handcuffs, but they were too strong to be broken open. While Teabag was feeling triumphant, John approached carrying an axe, leaving Teabag stunned. That's how Teabag lost one hand. They hurriedly made their way towards the airport but didn't expect that their plane had already been discovered by the police. John's men also sensed something was wrong and decided to leave first. When the escape team arrived at the airport, the plane had already taken off. Their hopes were shattered once again, and they could only begin a new round of life-or-death escape. 